thank you for your very generous introduction. Thank you also to the BNS Executive Committee, both for considering me for this award and for organizing the spring meeting. So as Nikki mentions, my name is Keir. I'm a neuropsychologist, Alzheimer's Society Fellow, and Etherington PCH Senior Research Fellow. And I lead the University College London Longitudinal Study of Posterior Cortical Atrophy with Sebastian Crutch. My background's originally in working in day center and care home settings, evaluating effects of psychosocial interventions on cognitive functions and day-to-day -day abilities for people with various dementia syndromes. But I've since spent most of the last 12 years here at Queen Square, where I work with people with posterior cortical atrophy and other people living with various degrees of cortical visual impairment owing to neurodegenerative disease. I'd like to acknowledge Elizabeth Warrington for her seminal work in characterizing cortical visual functions, the vulnerability to different neurodegenerative diseases, and her lasting contributions across a number of areas. I'd like to thank Sebastian Crutch for better characterizing and understanding posterior cortical atrophy and being a supervisor, friend, and mentor over the last 10 years. I'll be thanking collaborators who I've had the privilege of working with throughout this talk. I'll be focusing on how insights provided through working with people with posterior cortical atrophy have influenced and challenged the way that we think about Alzheimer's disease, neurodegeneration, cognition, and function. Start by making a case for how a detailed appreciation of cognitive profile has led to a better biological understanding of Alzheimer's disease. I'll then emphasize the role of individual patient participants whose shared accounts have prompted a series of investigations into counterintuitive and disabling symptoms, as well as the development and evaluation of compensatory strategies predicated on participants' residual strengths and their capabilities. Cover methodological approaches to evaluate cognition and behavior, from neuropsychology to engineering. And I'll finish with how interdisciplinary working has promoted our understanding of mechanisms underlying disturbed spatial orientation and balance. And tend to highlight the reciprocity of these areas in the application for improving diagnosis, support and treatment for individuals with prompt disturbances in their vision and spatial awareness owing to neurodegenerative disease. Almost three and a half decades ago, the neurologist Frank Benson reported five patients with a dementia syndrome which is characterized by the early and progressive loss of visual functions. This being despite preserved visual acuity, memory, and insight. The complex, high order nature of visual symptoms, somewhat accompanied by structural imaging findings, prompted use of the term posterior cortical atrophy. The first of these individuals is described as a 64 year old former bank executive who presented with episodes of anxiety, which complicated a slowly progressive disturbance of vision and language. About eight years earlier, he had noted difficulty reading. He remained at his job, but his secretary had to read to him. Although still able to write, he could not read what he had produced. Eventually, he also lost the ability to write and had difficulty finding his way in familiar areas and in performing visually mediated tasks. His problems slowly progressed. He stated that what he saw disappeared before he could sense what it was. Upon examination, he was alert, orientated, attentive, and in reasonably good physical health. His manner was gracious and his insight was painfully apparent. He walked as a blind, but could navigate the room without colliding into anything. When offered a chair, he had difficulty finding it. And when he did, sat on the arm before correctly seating himself. Around the same time, work by Patrick Hoff and colleagues reported individuals with neuropathologically confirmed Alzheimer's disease, but with similar complex visual symptoms an increased distribution of Alzheimer's disease pathology in visual and visual association areas relative to individuals with more typical memory-led Alzheimer's disease. These initial descriptions of posterior cortical atrophy are broadly in keeping with a number of individuals since seen at the UCL Dementia Research Center. Presented here are fluid registered images showing the contraction of occipital temporal and posterior parietal regions in green and blue over a period of seven years. 
So above are MRI scans, and these are from a participant who'd actually volunteered for research at UCI as a control, but had developed PC over the course of his participation. This person passed away in 2015, upon which he received a primary neuropathologic diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Some of the earliest symptoms he reported included difficulty in reading, with him losing his place in a page of text. He had difficulty interpreting analog clocks, felt less confident walking downstairs, and had diminished calculation and handwriting skills. With some of these standing in stark contrast, some of the symptoms more typically reported in memory-led Alzheimer's disease. Neuropsychological assessment noted impaired performance on tasks featuring prominent visual components. In fact, he only formally performed below the normal range on verbal measures of episodic memory function, years after suspicion of posterior cortical atrophy was first raised. Over this period of three decades, the terms posterior cortical atrophy, Benson syndrome, or visual variant Alzheimer's disease, have often been used interchangeably to refer to a neurodegenerative syndrome, which is characterized by the early and progressive loss of visual and other posterior cortical functions. While Alzheimer's disease appears to be the most common cause in at least three quarters of documented individuals with posterior cortical atrophy, the PCA syndrome also arises from underlying Lewy body pathology, cortical basal degeneration, or very rarely Prahn disease or MAPT or progranular mutations. Now, consistent with the term posterior cortical atrophy, PCA patients tend to have reduced cortical thickness in posterior parietal and occipital temporal regions, and increased cortical thickness in the medial temporal lobes relative to individuals with more typical memory at Alzheimer's. And correspondingly, PCA patients demonstrate relatively preserved episodic memory function, at least at earlier stages of the disease course. Contrast to more typical and well-recognized dementia syndromes where the earlier symptoms might include difficulty in short-term memory, their planning or word finding difficulties. Some of the earliest symptoms of PCA include difficulty with driving, reading, and perceiving locating objects presented in clear view. Unfortunately, many people with PCA often face a very drawn out diagnostic process. Early symptoms may be interpreted as stress, anxiety, or symptoms of menopause. People may be misdiagnosed as having had a stroke. By far the most common experience relates to seeing one eye health professional after the other. Or the while being told that for the visual symptoms that people are reporting, these cannot be accounted for by an eye condition. But it's not necessarily prompting referral to see a neurologist, neuropsychologist, neuroophthalmologist, or dementia specialist. As an example of some of the difficulties experienced by people with PCA, I'm going to present a recording of this participant being asked to reach for the hand of this neurologist. Now, this participant has consented to the use of this footage for educational and training purposes. Can you see my hand? Yes. Grab it yes. for me. Where is it? <laughs> where is it? You got it? God, where is it? You'll find it in a minute. Wow. Ah. You got it. Very good. Those profound difficulties in perceiving objects presented in clear view raises some key questions regarding why Alzheimer's disease may affect different people, often in very different ways, as well as the implications for their appropriate care and support. This individual's cerebral spinal fluid profile was consistent with underlying Alzheimer's disease. He volunteered for research at UCL for years and only formally performed below the normal range on verbal measures of episodic memory function years after the onset of his visual symptoms. To date, this participant and over 160 other people diagnosed with PCA have generously volunteered at UCL for neuropsychological assessments and MRI scans for up to six annual visits. Through multi-center working with University of California, San Francisco, University of Virgin Dorothea, and UCL's progression of neurodegenerative disease group, we've estimated changes in regional brain volumes over participant visits, as well as estimated the ordering of cognitive symptoms. Presented here are estimates of regional brain volumes over time points. Estimates are consistent with the particular vulnerability of parietal and occipital regions as well as the relative resilience of so-called Alzheimer's disease signature regions, such as entorhinal hippocampal structures in PCA compared to typical Alzheimer's disease. This posterior vulnerability and medial temporal lobe sparing in PCA may be apparent not only at participants' initial visits, but extending into the disease course. 
Now, recent years, molecular imaging techniques have increasingly enabled visualization of the hallmark pathology associated with Alzheimer's disease, these amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tau tangles, but in vivo. Presented here is increased tau pet uptake in a group of people with PCA relative to healthy controls, emphasizing this tau deposition, particularly in visual association cortices. Presented here is an individual with posterior cortical atrophy and another individual with typical Alzheimer's disease. The predominantly parietal occipital or temporal tau deposition are broadly in keeping with their cognitive profiles, that is predominantly visual-led or predominantly memory-led. The serial cortical actually raises a number of questions. So notably, why might some individuals have the same underlying pathology as in typical Alzheimer's disease, yet differ quite markedly in their symptoms? What are the reasons behind the relative sparing of so-called Alzheimer's disease signature regions, such as the medial temporal structures highlighted here? And can developing our understanding of regional sparing and vulnerability in Alzheimer's disease perhaps provide us with a catalyst for the development of future therapeutic strategies? Now, the last 10 years has not only seen the increasing recognition of neuropathological heterogeneity in Alzheimer's disease, with a proportion of patients whose regional tau burden or autopsy is consistent with the sparing of hippocampal relative to neocortical regions, but also with data and theory-driven Alzheimer's disease subtypes obtained from large data-sharing initiatives, these emphasizing prominent posterior abnormality across the wider Alzheimer's disease spectrum, not only limited to PCA, Presented here are regional differences of posterior predominant Alzheimer's disease relative to other Alzheimer's disease subtypes. So this is defined here by tau pet trace uptake. This prominent occipital tau deposition appears apparent in a substantial proportion of individuals with positive AD biomarkers. Topographical differences in the distribution of tau pet uptake is shown alongside this previous figure comparing PCA and typical Alzheimer's disease cortical thickness with both posterior tau and PCA groups showing this relative preservation of medial temporal structures contrasted by this posterior vulnerability. Separate work involving cognitively defined subgroups suggests that 10 to 16% of patients with so-called typical late onset Alzheimer's disease may have predominant visual spatial deficits as assessed with these figure cobbing tasks presented here relative to measures, say, of memory, language, and executive function. It's worth emphasizing that the great majority of individuals assigned to these subtypes almost certainly do not fulfill PCA criteria, most are from cohorts which essentially exclude people with PCA and young onset Alzheimer's disease. However, they might be in line with the notion of PCA as an extreme example of phenotypic heterogeneity and sporadic Alzheimer's disease, and perhaps suggest factors associated with the resilience of hippocampal structures, as well as the tendency to exhibit predominant memory or visual spatial symptoms such as the APOE genotype. The genetic basis of PCA is unclear, so the PCA presentation itself does not appear to run in families. The largest genetic study of PCA provided evidence that while APOE, which is the strongest genetic risk factor associated with sporadic Alzheimer's disease, was indeed associated with increased risk for PCA. Its risk effect was significantly smaller for PCA compared to typical Alzheimer's disease. Studies of PCA and other atypical memory sparing forms of Alzheimer's disease raise this recurring conundrum. Atypical and predominantly young onset Alzheimer's disease patients appear, if anything, less likely to be APOE E4 carriers. And this is despite the presence of the E4 allele normally being associated with the younger age of onset in typical amnestic Alzheimer's disease. This recent analysis of the neuropathological sample from the National Alzheimer's Disease Coordinating Center provide evidence that almost half of young onset APOE E4 negative AD patients exhibited an atypical, i.e. non-memory-led clinical presentation, with APOE E4 negative patients overall appearing to exhibit this bimodal distribution of age of onset. Now, I'd just like to note here the key role of cognitive characterization and emphasize these interactions, whereby the effect of APOE on age of onset appears to differ by Alzheimer's disease cognitive field. These findings follow seminal work by Julie Snowden and others on APOE status varying by cognitive profile, challenging the perception that a lower age of onset is inevitably associated with the presence of an E4 allele. 
Such variations in cognitive profile not only have implications for people's diagnosis and care, which can be evident at the level of individual patients, they also raise research questions regarding the biological basis of Alzheimer's disease phenotypic heterogeneity. This recent Lancet Neurology Review on Atypical Alzheimer's disease refers to individuals who have the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's, but whose initial and prominent symptoms do not characteristically relate to memory. Instead, their symptoms may relate to difficulties with vision and spatial awareness, such as in posterior cortical atrophy, or in other individuals with language, planning and behavior, and movement. Beyond raising fundamental research questions regarding why Alzheimer's disease may affect different people, often very differently, as well as considering some of the neuropathological and mechanistic underpinnings. This review also makes recommendations for the appropriate support and treatment for people with PCA. For example, it recommends that people with PCA may be eligible to register as being partially sighted, even if their visual difficulties arise from a cortical rather than ocular or optic basis. Now, people may benefit from certain professionals, for example, psychologists, our health professionals, and approaches which are tailored to their clinical and cognitive profile. Multi-center consensus criteria define PCA both at syndromic and disease levels. The PCA clinical radiological syndrome is defined principally based on core clinical and cognitive features presented here as frequencies at presentation. Throughout the remainder of this talk, I'll be touching on a number of these, in particular, alexia, space perception, environmental agnosia, as well as other features that are not obviously included. In the next few slides, I'll be discussing how reports shared by PCA participants of having difficulty, say, with perceiving objects amongst clutter, with letters jumbling up and becoming transposed within or between words, or people becoming lost in a page of texture and reading, have advanced our theoretical understanding of cortical visual functions and peripheral dyslexia, as well as informed the development of the AIDS mitigating reading loss. A common complaint from people with PCA is a particular difficulty perceiving or locating objects presented in clear view. With reports such as this emphasizing the tendency for objects which are close together to merge or combine into one unrecognizable object. Now, prompted by comments such as this, Sebastian Crutch and Elizabeth Warrington, followed by myself, conducted a series of case studies and later group studies to get a better understanding of the nature of these cluttering effects, and in particular, under what conditions such effects might be reduced. We started off by administering very simple stimuli, these letters present in isolation to 26 participants with PCA. Participants' ability to perceive these stimuli was very good. People barely made any errors at the group level. However, when administering the same stimuli surrounded by visual clutter, so these other letters, shapes, or objects, not only did participants start to make errors, but particularly so under the condensed condition, so when the clutter is close to the target stimulus, relative to when it's spaced apart. And its spacing effect was consistent regardless of the category of flanker. And this is more in line with a low level visual deficit, as opposed to say a higher order category specific deficit that might be evident say with attentional dyslexia. Furthermore, this space effect could be somewhat mitigated with the use of clutter of opposite contrast polarity. By that I simply mean this white clutter relative to a black target. This pattern performance is consistent with an early visual processing deficit known as visual crowding. Now, visual crowding is actually something that limits all of our healthy peripheral vision. That's one reason, along with the drop off in our visual acuity, why it's very difficult for us to read using our peripheral vision or pick out a face in the corner of our eye in a crowd of people. However, for people with PCA, they're experiencing perceptual difficulties in line with crowding in their central vision. Given how in healthy individuals, crowding is largely attributed to early visual processes at the level of striate or extra striate cortex. We conducted voxel-based morphometry analysis, which is restricted to the occipital lobe. And this suggested that an increased spacing effect in the PCA group was associated with reductions in gray matter volume near the right collateral sulcus and lingual gyrus. These anatomical correlates, accompanied by detailed error analysis, perhaps offer an opportunity to better understand how crowding may result from neurodegenerative disease. Averaging or substitution of countercrowding 
proposed that crowding results, either when information about the target and adjacent flank disease erroneously integrated, perhaps owing to cells averaging information across a large area, or alternatively, that flankers and their features are intermixed, essentially owing to noisy positional information. Our analysis suggested that increasing visual similarity of areas to the pool target and flankers, defined here simply as pixel overlap, was associated with an increased tendency to make errors. However, there was no evidence of a similar association between the flankers and error responses. And this being despite some error responses, which were the flankers themselves, i.e. being maximally visually similar. Alongside imaging correlates suggesting the role of extra stride and perhaps B4 cell loss, findings may be consistent with the erroneous averaging of target and flankers, perhaps owing to the vulnerability of complex cells resulting in diminished capacity to suppress simple cell signals within that larger complex receptive field. A striking and counterintuitive complaint from people with posterior cortical actually includes particular difficulty perceiving large versus small objects. This is something which is very neatly summarized by a patient who attended clinic right here at the National Hospital. He mentioned they had a great deal of difficulty recognizing the headline of a newspaper that was right in front of them. However, working towards the end of the train carriage they were sat on, they had a great deal less difficulty recognizing the very same headline presented at a distance. This particular difficulty perceiving large versus small objects has been noted across a range of case studies. And while the basis of this so-called inverse size effect is still unclear, where this has clear implications is in asking the question, what are appropriate aids, adaptations, or strategies to support someone who has diminished visual function owing to neurodegenerative disease? For example, you might have someone with serial cortical atrophy who would go to a low vision clinic and say, I've got difficulty in my reading, you might provide them with some aid or technology which would blow up the font size of text, if anything, making it more difficult for that person to read. Same group of participants who conducted the crowding study were also administered a perceptual reading corpus comprising 192 words. Similarly to previous case studies, overall PCA participants made more errors reading larger versus smaller words and this so-called inverse size effect was associated with reductions in gray matter volume in an area roughly corresponding to the rights of pure priority lobby. Damage to similar regions in other patient groups has been associated with difficulty perceiving or locating objects presented in peripheral vision. The findings are perhaps consistent with proposals of a restriction in the effective visual field, whereby objects of a certain size are extending into peripheral vision and thus are more difficult to perceive, but following posterior parietal damage. It's worth noting that of these 26 PCA participants, not one, but two demonstrated remarkably rapid and accurate reading, despite exhibiting a range of visual processing deficits. Now, some successful single word reading may seem a little counterintuitive, perhaps particularly so given both individuals have difficulty distinguishing very simple shapes. So for example, this square from this rectangle, you are somehow able to recognize words. Examples of accurately read words included some of the following presented here. So for example, low frequency, longer words such as idiosyncrasy and judicature. Relative sparing of canonical ventral functions such as single word reading, despite marked visual spatial difficulty, may be apparent in many other people with PCA, some of whom may miss a computer screen that's right in front of them, it's able to read a word like somnambulist and their gaze happens to fall upon. It. Notably, at their baseline visits, neither participant failed either of two visual measures, so a simple visual acuity task or a measure assessing excessive visual crowding. Now, this association between reading as a complex behavior and various visual deficits is not only a little counterintuitive, but it also poses challenges for certain accounts of reading. A general visual account of reading suggests that reading may be disrupted by even very subtle low level visual deficits which propagate up the visual system. The prediction of these accounts is that such deficits ultimately manifest in word length effects and reading speed consistent with an effortful serial letter by letter reading strategy. This owing to the diminished capacity to perceive words 
and process letters and power. Here are five letter by letter readers who exhibit these abnormal decreases in reading speed as a function of word length, with their slopes ranging from around 300 to 800 milliseconds. Controls even with brain damage have essentially flat slopes, well below 50 milliseconds per letter. Now presented here are Foll and Kla, these two PCA participants, whose reading speed slopes across words of these lengths are comparable to those of healthy controls. Given their extensive visual impairments, such individuals suggest that general visual function does not itself necessitate reading deficits, either in terms of errors or letter by letter reading. Instead, it suggests that specific rather than general visual deficits may play a causal role in undermining reading. These two participants were subsequently followed up over a period of two years to understand whether any decline in their reading was accompanied by the emergence of particular additional visual deficits. Is both reading percentage error on the primary y axis and reading speed in the secondary y axis. You can see both accurate and rapid reading for both participants compared to healthy controls. And this is followed by a decline of the subsequent visits, perhaps particularly evident through Clara's reading speed declining sharply at her two year follow up. Now, of note, participant Fall had reported letters and words appearing to press in on each other during reading. And in addition, on follow-up visits, both participants began to make errors on these flanked letter identification tasks, particularly when surrounding visual clutter was close to the central letter relative to when it's spaced apart, consistent with the emergence of excessive visual crowding. A strong relationship between crowding and peripheral dyslexia has been noted in other populations, for example, people with macular degeneration or amblyopia, this might provide us with some clues on the development of age support diminished reading owing to posterior cortical atrophy. Now, reading is an activity which is affected early on in PCA and in the majority of people. To give an idea of the tendency for people with PCA to become lost in a page of text while reading, for this article, rather than read this out as the most outspoken judge on the US Supreme Court has defended the use of some physical interrogation techniques. This participant with PCA has read us out in the following order. The most outspoken judge in the Supreme Court has defended, and I go back to the first line, supreme the most the BBC could be in the face. Fortunately, there's not one, but a number of factors which might limit reading at the text level for people with PCA. Is a crude depiction of how someone with excessive visual crowding might experience letters and words jumbling or cluttering up is another crude depiction of where someone with a restriction in their affected visual field might have difficulty perceiving words adjacent to where they're currently fixating making it difficult to anticipate where to move to next within text is an example of where someone might become lost on a page of text while moving within or between uh, lines this possibly relating to difficulties either in directing or maintaining fixation here are eye tracking recordings from a PCA participant who's being asked to maintain their fixation on this stationary point at the center of a computer screen over a period of 10 seconds. Around six seconds in, you can see a large intrusive saccade whereby this person's gaze shoots off horizontally before quickly moving back to the stationary fixation point. However, when formally investigating text reading in a group of people PCA, people's reading was quite good for certain words within passages. Presented here in a darker shade of green are words that are read out more accurately, more consistently by a group of PCA participants during their text read. The suggestion that words which are read out more accurately tend to be clustered towards earlier parts of text. And in addition, on the perimeter of paragraphs rather than towards the center of each paragraph of text itself. And this is perhaps consistent with the notion that words towards the center of each paragraph are more susceptible to these cluttering or crowding effects. Within piloted reading aids based on a very simple premise, that minimizing some of the spatial and perceptual demands of reading might promote more accurate and pleasant reading for people with PCA. So we use a technique known as rapid serial visual presentation. This involves presenting text in chunks, one or two words at a time, rather than all at the same time. And in this way, we hope to minimize the amount of adjacent words which would be adversely active in visual clutter. And such techniques have been used separately to support reading for individuals who are forced to use their crowded peripheral vision 
following central visual laws. Words are presented within a fixation box at the center of the screen to avoid the need to direct one's gaze or attention all around a page of text. And the box itself is of opposite contrast polarity to the text. In this way, we hope to limit inadvertently introducing cluttering effects through even this simple additional visual feature. Participants' reading accuracy under standard text presentations are all at the same time is shown here. When using these sealed text presentation techniques, participants' reading accuracy increased from around 50 to 60% at the group level, so that standard presentation all at the same time to more like 90 to 95%. Subsequent work led by my colleague Ida Suarez-Gonzalez is through a process of co-design incorporated these and other findings in the development of assistive technology to promote reading as an independent activity into the disease course. Now, this application of understanding PCA symptoms towards informing compensatory strategies ultimately intends to address the needs of people who might mention they need a little bit of help, but with a range of things. Now, to point the disease course where someone with PCA might have remarkably preserved memory, language and insight, might require assistance with navigating a familiar environment, with making themselves a drink, aspects of their dressing or transfers. After by some of these very life-limiting consequences of dementia-related visual loss, we conducted a series of pilot investigations evaluating effects of the built environment on functional abilities within this accessibility laboratory. The advantage of this lab is that we can introduce aids in form to our neuropsychological investigations or strategies which are being shared by individual patient participants. We can investigate whether these aids, adaptations, strategies, promote the ability of people with PCA and people with more memory and Alzheimer's disease to more reliably and confidently conduct everyday tasks within this control setting. For example, in reaching a certain target destination or locating a certain object. As part of a series of home visits, Participants have shared strategies that they're currently implementing to manage parts of the home. Presented here are examples of the strategic use of contrast or lighting and emphasizing a certain object or destination within the home. When increased reliance on conspicuous visual cues may relate, relate to separate findings from eye tracking investigations, with these suggesting that the fixation position of PC participants was particularly influenced by visually salient parts of scenes. So for example, where there's a stark edge or a difference in color or contrast. Correspondingly, we investigated whether visual cues based on the strategic use of contrast or visual motion might facilitate visually guided navigation to target destination. Presented here is a point of view video from a PCA participant within a control setting. The participant is walking to a target destination in the presence of this combined contrast and motion cue with a circle showing their recorded fixation position. Participants are walking throughout the setting. We're able to determine their movement and position using wearable sensors, these inertial measurement units. While at their simplest, these provide accelerations in a reference frame, which is corresponding to where the sensor is attached, so for example, the foot. We can generate more complex measures, firstly, by transforming these local accelerations in a foot centered reference frame to a lab centered reference frame. Secondly, by integrating accelerations to estimate velocity. Then identify periods where the foot's in contact with the ground to correct for any sense of velocity drift. And we can then integrate corrected velocity to estimate foot displacement for each step relative to a point of origin. That is the start of each record. And in this way, we can estimate walking paths such as those presented here. And these correspond to control participants walking to target destinations on the left-hand side of the setting. If the paths are direct and consistent for controls, these are in contrast to a number of patient participants who exhibited these indirect paths. And these were taken not only for participants with posterior cortical atrophy, but a number of people with typical Alzheimer's disease. It's the instances of people veering off before eventually reaching the target destination or taking the long way around. One example of a PCA participant becomes disorientated to the point where he doubles back on himself, reaching his starting position rather than the target destination itself. And just to emphasize, this is in a room which is relatively perceptually simple, that's four by six meters, and people being asked to walk to the target destination, a wide open door, that's just a few meters in front of them. 
But this task was interested in the effects of contrast and visual motion cues on time taken to reach destination. In patients overall, there was evidence to reduce time to take uh, to reach destinations in the presence of this simple contrast cue. While patients overall were more likely to fixate destinations in the presence of this visual motion and contrast cue, there was no evidence that this actually translated to improved task performance. The difficulties negotiating both familiar and unfamiliar environments are early symptoms of PCA. And many people report difficulties with things like use of escalators, and judging depth or hesitating in response to services with a lot of perceptual variation, glare and stark shadows. As well as quite unsettling reports such as there's a lot of reflection off surfaces. This may be misperceived as being a sheer drop. And prompted by comments such as these, we have to form investigations of the effects of lighting variability and walking to visible destinations in people with relatively mild PCA. Through adjusting the position of overhead lighting and the configuration of the setting, we're able to create conditions whereby the floor path to destinations is interrupted by shadows to varying degrees. and refer to these as no, medium, or high shadow conditions. Now, importantly, these conditions are matched for overall lighting levels, as well as for room configuration, but they differ in terms of lighting variability. As order effects are a feature of this and other repeated measures investigations covered as part of this presentation, environmental conditions were arranged in variants of a Latin square design, each of which are counterbalanced within participle. Four different counterbalance schedules are presented here. Each was randomly assigned to an individual participant. And in this way, we control for order effects both within and between participants. An advantage of these movement sensor techniques is that we can not only estimate parts, we can also identify individual steps which are disproportionately slow for each trial within each environmental condition and within each participant. By using individual steps as observations, we fit a three-level linear mix effects model of random effects for trial within room condition and within participant. Step time outliers were defined as individual steps with a standardized residual greater than three, and these representing disproportionately slow steps for a given participant taking into account that their steps are clustered by trial and by condition. We can then plot the position of these step time outliers using the previously outlined pedestrian dead reckoning technique. Here are gray walking paths and these colored markers indicating outlying or hesitant steps for the PCA group walking to both left and right hand side destinations. Not only again can you see examples of these indirect paths but also these disproportionately slow steps, perhaps particularly so under medium and high shadow conditions. The suggestion that these hesitant steps and longer completion times tend to occur to a greater extent under higher shadow conditions, with these hesitant steps appearing to be clustered around parts of the environment leading up to these stark shadow regions. Such hesitant steps appear to be more apparent when approaching shadow regions in PCA compared to either control or typical Alzheimer's disease groups. Now, these findings implicate the emergence of dementia-related visual loss in the more widely documented phenomenon of atypical adaptive gait response. For example, people overstepping stark shadows or patterned carpet in intermediate to advanced stages of all-cause dementia syndromes, not only limited to PCA, with these being noted in parallel interviews with health and social care professionals who are working in community and long-term care settings. I'd like to note that findings presented up until this point have been incorporated into professional engagement materials involving staff working in long-term care settings, as well as continuing professional development resources for eye health and occupational therapist audiences to better assess, understand, and support people living with dementia-related visual loss. Because maybe we'll just continue. The next bit gets a little bit dense, so. So an anticipated, well, one unanticipated finding from these accessibility laboratory studies were the occasional discrepancies between the degree of people's cortical visual impairment and the degree of functional independence. For example, not every PCA participant with prominent cortical visual impairment on formal examination exhibited some of the indirect paths here. While a number of typical Alzheimer's disease participants, albeit with prominent posterior features, 
had profound difficulty reaching destinations within their immediate range of perception. These are perhaps suggestive of the contribution of non-visual disturbances, perhaps particularly in their egocentric experience. While we use wearable motion sensors for tracking participants' orientation and movement, something not explicitly considered within these investigations are our own sensory receptors, which enable us to determine our orientation and self-movement based on information beyond the visual domain. Now, it isn't a simple question of how we orientate ourselves to our immediate space. One particular consideration in orientating the vertical planes is that we're orientating ourselves relative to something else, that is the world around us, which enables us to perceive the world in a stable and upright manner. Well, someone might say, well, surely we perceive what's vertical or upright based on what looks to be upright. But what happens in the scenario, say, where the train carriage is traveling through a pitch black tunnel or simply when these passengers close their eyes? Or someone else might say, well, surely you perceive what's upright based on what feels to be upright. So for example, with this hand contact in the bar or the feet contact in the ground. Such somatosensory alone has difficulty distinguishing between, say, body motion on a stationary train carriage and a stationary body on a moving train. Someone else might say, well, as I understand it, our vestibular organs, but actually the otoliths, can not only sense head movement, but also the direction of gravity. So surely you'd perceive what's upright based off these. But these vestibular signals alone have difficulty distinguishing between the head accelerating forward on a flat surface versus it moving pitched upwards at a constant velocity. Perception of upright can really be thought of as a multi-sensory estimate, an estimate of our subjective vertical, which depends not only on one, but multiple sources of verticality information from our different senses. Each sense has its own particular limitations, uncertainties, and inaccuracies. The optimal estimate of verticality might therefore weight each source of verticality based on its reliability, so represented here by the width of these black Gaussian curves, in order to minimize inaccurate or biased verticality perception and to reduce perceptual uncertainty. Now, where this is relevant in the context of PCA, are participants reporting balance and postural abnormalities? For example, with some people leaning to one side or with the head pitched forwards. Others report particular difficulties transferring from standing to sitting. The complex disturbances in spatial orientation experienced in PCA, that's best articulated by one participant who asked her daughter, am I the right way up while sitting? Or another participant reported a dramatic room tilt illusion, the recording for which I'll present to you now. When I got downstairs, the whole of the room was upside down. Gosh which was actually very scary, but I got over that when I realised it was okay, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But it was completely, the bottom was on the top and the top was on the bottom. By comments such as these, we investigated what looks or what feels upright in people with posterior cortical atrophy and people with typical Alzheimer's disease. For the visual vertical task, participants were asked to adjust a visually presented bar to be as upright as possible. And they did this using a large handheld dial. Participants were sat with their head and trunk in a fixed position within a darkened room. They could take as long as they liked to perform the task. Presented here are estimated marginal means, 95% confidence intervals, and participant observed means for the visual vertical task. Absolute bias, regardless of direction, was greater in both patient groups and controls, being greatest in PCA. For a number of trials, the bar was presented within a visual orientation cube, a square frame, which is tilted 18 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise. A modest biasing effect is observed in the control group in the direction of the tilted frame, as this with previous studies, with this frame-induced bias being three to four times greater in patients overall across tilt conditions, being consistently directed towards frame tilt. Perceptual uncertainty or within individual variability was greater in both patient groups, but being greatest in PCA. The haptic vertical task. Participants were asked to manually orientate a physically held rod to be as upright as possible. Participants were sat upright, and crucially, they performed this task without any visual information of the held bar of their own body or of the environment. 
elastic vertical bias is presented here under unimanual and bimanual grip conditions. And these are determined either by the right or by the left hand. Bias in the frontal plane is greater across all groups for unimanual relative to bimanual conditions, being directed towards the opposite side of the bottom hand, which is determining the grip. The side-induced directional biases not only appear to be similar to the frame-induced biases, but in this case being directly determined by the bottom hand rather than by the tilted frame, but they're greater in both patient groups, but particularly so in PCA. These findings emphasize abnormality on the haptic vertical task within the PCA group, despite this task lacking any explicit visual information, and despite the common notion of PCA as the cardinal visual form of dementia. Sexual uncertainty was again greater in both patient groups, greatest in PCA. Participant measures of visual and haptic vertical bias and uncertainty can be thought of as reflecting their subjective vertical, which is again the product of multiple senses, and in particular, a system of receptors which sense the direction of gravity. These receptors range from the vestibular otolis, skin receptors contacting the floor or chair, as well as kidneys and large blood vessels. A key challenge for the brain is to transform these sensory signals from the reference frame in which the sensor is embedded, be it head, body, centered, into a gravity-centered reference frame. So we refer to this system of graviceptors and the respective spatial transformations as the primary mechanism. And by modeling participants observe perceptual bias and uncertainty as the product of primary and local secondary retinal, or hand-based mechanisms, we're able to estimate the uncertainty of this primary mechanism with some assumptions. So we define each participant's subjective vertical based on their observed task performance. Here, two Gaussians with observed mean bias and uncertainty, for an example, PCA participants with, without and with visual cues. Assume local retinal-based mechanisms have a bias of zero and 18 without and with visual cues, given that the frame tilt is 18 degrees. We can then estimate primary mechanism uncertainty based on the relative uncertainty between these local retinal mechanisms. Similarly, subjective haptic vertical was defined as observed mean bias and uncertainty, because then presented here from example PCA participant under unimanual and bimanual conditions. Modern subjective vertical as a product of local secondary hand-based mechanisms is analogous to the retinal mechanisms, as well as a primary mechanism. We assume primary mechanism certainty is half that with bimanual versus unimanual grips. So primary mechanism uncertainty converge with increasing local hand-based bias under bimanual and unimanual conditions. Estimated primary mechanism uncertainty approaches conservative asymptotic values. These are presented here for all participants incorporating their observed visual and haptic vertical measures. Are lower for visual versus haptic vertical tasks, and crucially are higher in both patient groups relative to the control group, but being highest in PCA. This might be to do with the varying demands of spatially transforming information for visual versus haptic vertical tasks. Assuming vestibular otoliths provide the main graviceptive input while seated and at rest. For the visual vertical task, at its simplest, this requires a transformation from head to eye centered reference frames. Vertical task, on the other hand, requires transformation from head to body, arm, and hand centered reference. Seroparental regions are a key candidate site for spatially transforming multisensory information from different, particularly egocentric reference frames. These are vulnerable in Alzheimer's disease and particularly the serocortical atrophy. Presented here are regional differences in gray matter volume in the dominant seroparental lobule in the current sample of PCA compared to typical Alzheimer's disease partners. I'd just like to reiterate the central role here of PCA participants and enabling insights regarding some of the symptoms covered and their candidate underpinnings. These complemented with neuropsychological behavioral and engineering analyses have facilitated the development and evaluation of symptom management strategies.
ought to have made evident both the scientific and translational implications of some of the presented work, not only say regarding crowding, acquired dyslexia and their relationship, but also space perception. The question posed by our participant with PCA, am I the right way up? Paired with visual and haptic vertical assessment and a multi-sensory cue integration theory approach can perhaps inform our understanding regarding how and why space perception can be undermined in Alzheimer's disease and PCA. They help explain counterintuitive and sometimes paradoxical patient reports of an exaggerated reliance on local visual and somatosensory cues. So say, for example, during transfers, some participants are looking behind themselves to check where it is they're sitting or actively feeling for the chair. It is perhaps reflecting unreliable spatial transformation of sensory information between different reference frames. I've provided an overview of the PCA cognitive phenotype, movement sensor techniques, and compensatory approaches, which are predicated on relatively spared function. One area in which these might converge are reports of balance disorders in PCA and typical outside. This final task, we investigated our own compensatory strategy maintain balance despite sensory perturbation. So we use a technique known as galvanic vestibular stimulation. And this evokes a signal of apparent head acceleration from our own vestibular senses. And this in turn prompts a whole body compensatory balance response in the opposite direction of the apparent head movement. Now, crucially, we can introduce or restrict other types of sensory information when administering galvanic vestibular stimulation and in this way, we can investigate how the communication between different sensory systems mediates balance response. Standing balance tasks, participants are asked to stand upright with their feet positioned closely together. Galvanic vestibular stimulation was administered so that the head appeared to move left or right, prompting a whole body balance response in the other direction. And vision was either made available or restricted using wearable goggles. Now I'm going to present to you balance responses, which are forces generated by the person to maintain their balance, firstly in the absence of visual information. These are comparable across all three participant groups. This suggests that patients overall are reliably responding to vestibular stimulation, at least without visual information. Presented here are balance responses with available vision. While these are smaller with vision and control in typical Alzheimer's disease groups, this is consistent with the ability to dampen balance response with increasing visual information. There's a reduced effect of vision in dampening balance response in PCA relative to both control and typical Alzheimer's disease groups. Differing effect of vision between PCA and the other participant groups is evident during a very early response to vestibular stimulation, so only two to 400 milliseconds after stimulus onset. Findings may be in line with a compensatory, perhaps feed forward reweighting, whereby the balance system of PCA participants may be using visual information less relative to vestibular information in maintaining balance. Increased force plate responses with vision within the PCA group were associated with reduced gray matter volume in the regions highlighted here. These include relatively low level regions responsible for visual processing, so not only within occipital, but also thalamic regions. These findings perhaps reflect not only the need to be considering sensory and perceptual disturbances beyond the visual domain in PCA, but also anatomical sites which are distal to the posterior cortical regions most characteristically affected. Separate early pathological studies of PCA have suggested involvement of projections to the thalamus and the generation of the lateral, lateral genital nucleus, which might be important in understanding PCA, both in terms of clinical manifestations as well as underlying disease. Ongoing work is investigating proprioceptive disturbances in PCA, as well as day-to-day -day consequences of altered space perception. Now I'm going to present to you whole body motion capture data from a participant PCA who's being asked to sit on this chair. You can see she has difficulty with this task, sitting on the armrest rather than the seat of the chair itself this evoking the first of the five participants first described by Frank Benson. And I'm gonna to present to you whole body motion capture data from a participant with more typical memory-led Alzheimer's disease at an intermediate disease stage performing the same task. 
particularly for someone experiencing this degree of difficulties with their transfers, it's hard not to imagine some of the implications this might have for their day-to-day -day independence, and indeed for the nature and extent of support required in managing with everyday tasks. And I hope that further research regarding PCA will promote understanding of neurodegenerative diseases more broadly, from underlying pathology right up to clinical presentation, and from onset into the disease course. I'd like to thank and emphasize the role of PCA national and regional support groups, which are made possible through rare dementia support and the National Brain Appeal. It does not only enable peer to peer social, emotional, and practical support for people living with PCA and their families, but also encourages exchanges between researchers such as myself and people with lived experience of the condition. The exchanges mentioned throughout this talk have both steered avenues of research and subsequently promoted its translation and dissemination to professional and public audiences. I'd particularly like to thank people with PCA and their caregivers for so generously volunteering their time towards research over a period of years and across uniquely challenging circumstances. I'd like to thank you for your attention.